Father, I pray again uh, a prayer of gratitude and, and just I'm incredibly honored today. Some days I come in, Lord, and you, you show me what an honor it is to serve you in this way and praying for a beautiful child and being given the honor of uh, dedicating a child puts me back in that place where um, I just can't believe that you would use me to do this. Anyway, uh, I also can't believe that you would use me consistently to, to feed your people your word. And so I pray uh, today, dear God, you would make me worthy of that through the blood of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, you would anoint me to teach and to preach God's word in such a way that it, is, that it has impact um, on every mind and every heart that receives it. Say what you want to say today to this church and every single member of it through the teaching in Jesus' name, amen. So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 today, and and if you read ahead, and most of you don't, but if you did read ahead, um, you would probably go, wow, what is he going to do with that? Like this whole chapter is about food sacrificed to idols, and I don't see how that can be very relevant to us. Well, actually, the logic behind the way Paul deals with this issue is incredibly relevant to us because we have a lot of idols in our culture. Most of them we don't notice, and we don't idolize, so they don't really have any power, which is fine, Um, but we do have those. And the complexity of weak believers and strong believers and mature believers and immature believers and worldly believers and legalistic believers, like all this community of people, we're all different. We all have different backgrounds. We all have different preferences. We all have different baggage. We just, we come from a lot of different places. And so how we exercise our freedom um, in the midst of each other in such a way that we're loving and not dishonoring of another, uh, that's what this is really That's what this is really all about, being a community of people that lead people in a growing relationship with God, closer to God, and don't behave or act in such ways that would drive a wedge between uh, others and God, not doing anything um, to soil the conscience of another. That's really really the overarching message. So let me tell you in context what this was really all about. Back in the day... Um, people worshipped a lot of idols. Now, we do too. We just don't call it that, right? We worship athletes and rock stars, and we worship certain, you know, powerful people and things, and we have all kinds of idols, so to speak, that we worship, and that's really not today's message, though that is a great message, and we'll kind of go there. But back in the day, they like, it was like literally idols or gods uh, that they would worship, and of course, these were inanimate things, these weren't real things, but these were mythical things, and it was, some, it was a part of their culture. And so uh, these, you know, these pagan practices, what would happen is people would take, as kind of like the Hebrew people would take uh, a sacrifice to God, these people would take a sacrifice to their God or their idol, and their priests would do what the legitimate priest in Jerusalem would do, which is to offer the sacrifice, which was in this case meat, um, to that God. And so what would happen is the priest, the pagan priest, would offer, would offer the meat to God, uh, a fire sacrifice. About a third of it would get burnt up for the God. About a third of it would be given back to the person, and about a third of it would be given to the priest um, as kind of their payment. And so uh, the priests were getting like, they were just stockpiling all this meat, right? And so they were like, we need to, like, we need to monetize this. We, so it became a commodity and the priest would flood the market with their cheap meat. So, like, Taco Bell would have bought the priest meat, right? Because they get the cheap meat. I'm not sure that is meat, but if they bought meat, they would have bought the priest meat. They would have bought the cheap meat. And so people were buying this cheap meat from, uh, from the priest's market, and it kind of blended into the restaurants and the households, and the, it, was, it was everywhere. And sometimes you knew you were eating, you know, the, the food sacrificed to idle meat, and sometimes you... You didn't know, and it was just everywhere, and if you ate it, who cares, because idols aren't real, and it doesn't mean anything to me. It's just elements, and so this is what was happening. Well, those who were strong in their faith um, thought it was silly to worry about it, and they were probably right, and so they did it without worrying too much. Those who were weak in their faith that violated their conscience, that they might be eating something uh, that was sacrificed to an idol, and of course, the Jews, just they did their shopping in their own market because they had to eat kosher. But I do believe that the Jewish influence in the Corinthian church also caused a lot of division 
uh, around this issue. And so that, that is what was going on. And I want to tie that to idols that exist in our culture and things that maybe you and I have the freedom to do, even the right to do, but when we do them or we partake in them in a way that isn't like sensitive to the conscience of another, um, we can hurt them in the very same way the strong Christians were hurting the weaker Christians in Corinth. So let's dive in. That's kind of that's the background. Uh, now about food sacrifice to idols. So I define that for you. We know that we all possess knowledge. Now, <laughs> this first, these first two verses... This is Paul being very clever as he was. He's actually going to side with the strong Christians who believe that it's silly to worry about what we ate. He's going to side. With, he, he agrees with them. Uh, yet at the same time, he's going to, to not condemn them, but he's going to correct them from the sense that, but hey, when you do this in such a way as you violate the conscience of another then what you did isn't the sin. The fact that you did it in a way that hurt somebody else, that's the sin. And, and, then, and then I think he's really right here at the beginning peeling back and going, you know what? This really is, this is arrogance. Like you guys are just, you're just being arrogant and kind of above it all. And you're not gonna suffer those fools, right? And so uh, they seem to have this knowledge and indeed it is knowledge, but basically Paul is saying truth Without love is foolish. This, this knowledge without love is foolishness. That's the essence of these first few verses. So we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. In other words, you're not building anybody up you're just, other than your own ego. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. And so there, there's a lot that could be said about that, but basically what he's saying is you're boasting in your knowledge, the strength you have in your faith, and the presence of weaker Christians in such a way as you're tearing them down as you build yourself up, and it's not loving, and if you think that's really knowledge, that's no knowledge at all. That's, that's really what he's saying. Now, uh, let me give you some examples of, of idols in our culture things that might violate the conscience of another if they knew Pastor Brian was into this, right? One, one and this was a big one because I, uh, I owned a running shoe store when I was younger, like Nikes. I went through this whole period where I wouldn't wear Nikes because Nike is the Greek goddess of victory. And the whole company was about uh, exalting and worshiping athletes and these shoes and all of that. And it's no big deal. If you're wearing Nikes, I'm fine. Some preachers preach in Nikes. I'm okay with that. But like at the time, when I was weaker in my faith, I'd be like, I ain't wearing them Nikes. I went to Asics. Probably just as bad. But in my mind, it cleared my conscience. Now I would, wear, I would totally wear Nikes. I'd wear them in front of you because I've, I've grown in my faith. I don't wear them now because they're too narrow. And I like the big hokas with the big juicy bottom. So that's why I don't wear them now. Uh, another idol, um, and this is one I never repented of, uh, is Starbucks. You, you know that logo on the front? Like, that's a demigod. That's like a, that's like a serpent woman. That's like a mermaid that's there to seduce and, and bring pleasure. And, and I'm pretty sure the owners of the company weren't just being funny with it. Like they kind of, they felt like something was into that. Anyway. Don't mean nothing to me. I go to Starbucks all the time. Uh, another idol, this is maybe indirect. Maybe this isn't really an idol, but this is something to think about in the marketplace that might violate the conscience of another. It's just like shopping somewhere like Target. You never knew that could be controversial. But when you shop at a company that makes all these profits and leverages them for things in our culture and our society that are ungodly and unhealthy, like you walk into Target and they got like transgender clothes for your kids, it's like, what the heck? And so I never knew that was going to be one. I, I tried to boycott Target. I, I, I'm spending a lot less there. But they have those really good travel size things. You know, it's really hard to, hard to beat that, right? So th these are all, I, uh, oh, the big one, like, to me um, is music, right? I love, I love rock music and classic rock music. And all those guys sold their soul to the devil. But... It doesn't mean anything to me. God owns the music. God owns the musician. He created them. 
The lyrics mean to me what they mean to me. He owns all the words. He owns all the musical notes. Like if I can listen to it without it violating my conscience, so be it. But if somebody else can't, then, then I can't. Like, because like the ones I like the most, I'm sure, are the most overtly satanic, like the Rolling Stones. I know it's only rock and roll, but I like it. Like it. Yes, I do. Led Zeppelin, Stairway to Heaven. Like I can go to heaven on Stairway to Heaven. Other people are going to hell. I don't know what it is. So these are the kind of things that I'm talking about, right? And we can idolize and make idols of all that. That's another conversation for another day. I'm just talking about the things that exist in culture that you and I may be able to enjoy with freedom because our faith is strong, but when we do it in the presence of another, it can bring them down. And if we boast in, I mean, if we look at someone who perhaps can't wear a pair of Nikes or listen to the Rolling Stones without violating their conscience and we're arrogant towards them, this knowledge that we seem to have is no knowledge at all because truth without love is absolutely foolishness. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. And again, Paul is going to side with their logic. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. Essentially, all the elements and everything belong to God. Everything in the heavens and earth are yours, O Lord. And if what we receive, I mean, there are things that are objectively wrong, but what we receive and enjoy, we do with gratitude before God. We should have the freedom to do it. And as a matter of fact, we should be less paranoid about idols once we're in Christ than we were before. And so Paul's like, "Eh, you know, I agree with that. No problem there. Uh, For even if... Oh, by the way, even if, and this gets pretty interesting, there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, I'll get into that in a minute, yet for us, for Christians, there is but one God, almighty God. It means we don't have to worry about that, all those other layers. The Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. In in other words, we can come to this place where we receive a phenomenal revelation that indeed everything in the heavens and earth are the Lord's, and with gratitude and with sobriety, we can enjoy these things in such a way as actually we can glorify God and enjoy God and not be beaten down by legalism. And so he's agreeing with it. He's, he's like, it's sovereign. God is sovereign. And, and even those things that are meant for evil can be redeemed for good. Like, we, we have a freedom. You know, one of the, one of the big er, arguments in the early church was these two, two cultures coming together. It was the Gentile culture, which was just utterly pagan and, and raucous, right? And then the Jewish culture... Um, which was very legalistic. And, and that, these were the two cultures that collided to create the early church. And so these people, it, it was kind of ironic because the Gentiles who were so utterly wrong and off from God, being received by grace through faith in the simple teaching of the gospel and then filled with the Holy Spirit, like it was so simple, it was so amazing, was the grace. But the Jews, they were obviously saved in the same way, but part of them was like, maybe it was circumcision. Maybe it was the temple worship. Maybe it was at least reading and understanding and agreeing with the law. Maybe there's a little bit of merit in it. And, and so in, in a great irony, because all of that was legitimate and prescribed by God, it never brought them to God. That's why Jesus had to die on the cross. Uh, all of that seemed to be a disadvantage once they came into the kingdom because they were so insecure on their faith. They were wondering how much of that that merit stuff got them there versus the person who came in off the street utterly whacked a disaster before God that was radically saved. Who knew it couldn't be by performance? I worry about our homeschool kids some days. Like they're going to be thinking like it was because we did everything right. And it's like, no, it's not because you did everything right. And we're going to look down on the crazy kids coming out of the public school that have a radical saving experience with God in our own church. Like that is, we can have that dynamic as well. And so it's complicated and it's not just like I said it is, but that's the essence of what can be a great division 
and a hindrance in the body of Christ. And so the apostle Paul, he's actually, he's correcting those who seem to have the knowledge. You seem to be puffed up in the knowledge, but in correcting them, he has to be very precise. And he's got to say, hey, by the way, you, you're, you're really right. Now, I'm not saying that you're, you're not, you know, you're doing something that maybe is permissible but not beneficial. I'm not saying that maybe you should be so free. And it, it may, I'm not saying that maybe you do have that much freedom. Maybe it bothers you more than you think. But, but I am saying essentially that you're right. God is sovereign over all. If we enjoy it before God, if it means nothing to us, it means nothing to him. Idols are a myth. They do not exist. Only God exists. But we see in the, the very beginning of this, there are gods, and those gods are not, you know, the idol or the mythical god or the Starbucks god or the Nike god. They're, they're demons. They're gods with a little g. They're idols, and, and they may even be human, some kind of combination. And so that nefarious thing exists out there. But if your focus and my focus is on the Father through the blood of the Son by the power of the Holy Spirit, then we cut right through that and we don't really have to be paranoid about that. But for those who are superstitious, those idols can become real. So in verse 7, he says this, but not everyone possesses this knowledge, at least not yet. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that, have been, that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god, and their conscience is weak, and it, and it is defiled. Uh, one, one of the things you, you, you've heard me say many times is like, like people like really worship the devil and do crazy stuff. And and we're tempted to say, well, that's empty. There's nothing there because there's only one God. And, and that logic is true. Yet at the same time, there are gods. And we know that superstition elicits the very real presence or manifests the presence of demons and Satan. Um, that Ouija board stuff is spooky, man. It works. I mean, the devil will show up and he will tempt and he will seduce and he will... Bring, I mean, he looks for opportunities, chinks in our armor. So if, it, if we empower it, then it kind of has power. And if someone's conscience or their faith is weak, that empowers it. And they're not ready yet to enjoy that freedom. They're still tempted by what's associated with that freedom. And it still means something very different to them than maybe it means to you. Like, I'm, 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 I know some of you agree with me. Like, I can go out for a run. I can listen to my rock music, and I can worship God through, like, Bruce Springsteen. I'm a weird dude. But for somebody else, when they hear him, when they hear his lyrics, like, they don't, on the fly, translate them into something holy. Like, it means to them what it means to him. And it's tempting, and it's bad, and, and it soils their conscience. They're, they're not there yet. I have to think about that. And you have to think about that. The conscience is weak. It soils them. It defiles them. As I said, once upon a time, I quit wearing Nikes. You know, I quit, I quit going to bars, which was more than just an idol. That was a problem. Right before I married Elaine, I quit dating. That was just dangerous. That wasn't an idol. That was a problem, right? Right? I mean, I, I really had to separate myself from the world. Matter of fact, I remember one time, so I, I owned a running store and I did running events and we were looking for a sponsor for our marathon training team for our running club and we did an event in downtown Atlanta and we did this like 5K race and it finished at the Hard Rock Cafe. Hard Rock Cafe was the main sponsor of the event and so I took their money but I wouldn't go into their restaurant because rock and roll and bar and girls and music and beer and wine. I mean, you know, it was just, it was a bastion of what everything I was needing to get away from. And so, and you're like, some of you were like, how can you be so insecure? I was, I legitimately was. So we did this race. We had a great race. It was awesome. 
and we were looking for a sponsor. And so the, the girl who ran sponsorships for Mizuno, who was trying to get into the Atlanta market, trying to get nationally into the market for running, like she wanted to be a part of what we were doing. She wanted to be a sponsor for our club and our events and all that. And so the event was over and it went really well and everybody was, had a smile on their face and she was excited. She ran and she said, and she said hey, let's go in here and ha- have a drink and let's talk business. And I didn't do it. It was a girl, it was a bar, it was booze. It was like, it was like I looked at her and she had red hair. I don't know what it is. If she had a blue dress on, I would have known it was a devil in a blue dress, right? And she was cute. She wasn't nearly as pretty as Elaine, but she was cute. And I'm like, no. Like, I can't go in there. I can't do that. And so I didn't go, and I didn't do it. I insulted her. I didn't get the money, and she gave it to another rival running club. And, I mean, today, what would I do today? I would walk in there. I would establish rapport. I'd sip on a beer. I'd tell her what benefits were in it to, for her. I'd get her money. I'd go home, and I'd thank God for it, and I'd write a tithe check, Right? And there, that would be awesome, right? But that's not where I was. I didn't, I wasn't, that's not where, I, I wasn't secure enough. I was still tempted by things, and those things still had meaning to me. I, I had to get away from that for a while. So a, a good, loving brother or sister in Christ, pastor, shepherd, leader, influencer, in my life that was secure in those areas, they would have heard that story and they would have been like, you're a moron and you'd be absolutely right. But if they loved me, they would understand that guarding the the sanctity that I had between where I was then and my relationship with God was the most important thing in the world. Because if you soil someone's conscience, at least temporarily, you put a wedge in their fellowship with Christ and why would we exercise any freedom that would do that to someone else? And that's the complicated truth that Paul is trying to share with the Corinthian church over this one issue, but, it, but the logic affects so many others. Still, oh, by the way, food does not bring us near to God. We're no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Uh, remember Jesus one time said that the Pharisees and all the religious people were looking at his disciples and they didn't wash their hands before they ate or something and they didn't follow all the customs around eating and um, they, were, they were criticizing them and Jesus looked at them and said, look, don't you know, like, it's not what you put into your mouth that defiles you. Whatever you eat, whatever you drink, it goes in, it goes out. We won't get into those details, but it's just... It is what it is. It's just, it's just elements, right? What defiles a person isn't what goes into their mouth. It's what comes out of their mouth that is an overflow of their heart. Things such as greed, pride, lust, hatred, murder that comes out through word. Like, these are the things that defile us, what comes out of our mouth. Not the things that go in, but the things that come out. It's pretty logical, right? So in reality, that's the reality, but at the same time, I got to think about the people I'm around and where they are in their journey with God and what they experience externally, objectively, that elicits an unfaithful response out of their own hearts. Be careful, however, in light of what I just said, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating at an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. Uh, The Bible says very succinctly, that sin is everything we do or anything we do apart from faith in God. And you've heard me say a million times, faith isn't, we don't put our faith in whatever we want to put our faith in. We put our faith in the word of God, the revelation that God has given to us, what we have received from him. It begins with the gospel and then it's every word after. And as we grow with him and we grow in our faith and knowledge of God's word, our faith should grow as well. 
So when we've been doing this for years and we truly have matured in the faith, we have a lot of knowledge to build our life and our lifestyle on. By the way, it doesn't mean that we make good decisions universally, but it just means we have a lot more of that versus others that don't have that yet. So I, I can read, right? I can read verse eight, and, and by grace, through faith in those words, I can have a lot of freedom to do things that would soil other people's conscience. Yet at the same time, if I read on to verse nine, 10, 11, and 12, that says, when you sin against them in this way, and wound their weak conscience, you sin against God, then me enjoying my freedom in their presence actually becomes sin because I have the knowledge of that as well. And since they haven't received fully this revelation of the awesomeness of God and the freedom that we have in Christ, because they haven't received that, then it is sin for them still at this point. They don't have that knowledge yet. Tracking me? Okay, good, because you look like you're glazing over. Don't tempt people. Don't do things that would soil someone else's conscience. If you have the freedom to do it and it's resolved in your heart that it's okay before God, as Paul said in Romans chapter 14 in our last series, then, then so be it. But do it discreetly in such a way as not to hinder others. And oh, by the way, maybe scrutinize yourself a little bit because some of the things we boast that we have freedom in, we don't really have freedom in. And some of the things that we have freedom in are, that are permissible are not beneficial. So just, that's all I'm really saying. We can go home now. Not done. Therefore, bottom line, if what I eat or drink or wear or do or where I go causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never do it again so that I will not cause them to fall. So if that's true, Generally speaking, it must be really, really true in the body of Christ and probably even in our own families. You know, when, when you have children, you don't let them watch everything you watch. You don't let them read everything you read. You, you don't joke with them the way you joke with your friends, and you have to scrutinize your life a little more than you would, and most of us, me included, don't scrutinize it enough because they're not ready to be exposed to those things. They can't make good judgments around those things. So, so as it is... With our children, so it should be with our spiritual children. Within the body of Christ, the sacred assembly of God's people, as we grow, when we grow, because obviously we're poised for something in this community, people are gonna come, and our life and our lifestyle and what they see in and through us is going to be incredibly important. And it is our sacred responsibility to raise them to know and to love and to follow Jesus and to do things to cleanse their conscience and not cloud it up. When I was a child, I walked like a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, but now I'm an adult, I don't do that anymore, but we're gonna have children and we're gonna, we're gonna have to actually affirm decisions to withdraw themselves from the world and to extract themselves from the temptations of this world so that they can be set apart by Christ. And as they begin to experience freedom, we'll teach them as God has taught us uh, from 1 Corinthians 8, and many other places in scripture. The other thing we're doing here, we call ourselves the Monterey Church Hospital, is we're helping to protect the conscience and the lives of those who've been addicted and really way late in this world. We're trying to help people overcome those temptations. And so something that we can enjoy is not a temptation for us, might be a temptation for them. And so we had to think about those things. Uh, one of one of the things that, that I notice about the modern church is we don't like, we don't like rules. And the minute like a, a pastor or an authority figure or anybody starts talking about rules, right? Like people just run out the door. He's trying to control me. He's trying to dominate me, blah, blah, blah. And I, I mean, I gotta be the most chill pastor when it comes to this. But we gotta have, I would say, let's have some rules. How about some rules? You like that? It's not the law of God. It's not the command of God. It's, it's a little more than advice, but these are policies or rules we should have among ourselves. And, and one of them, I think the biggest one we need to have is we need to have a policy around alcohol, which they don't call spirits for nothing. I mean, you want to elicit something demonic. I mean, start hitting the booze. Now, we have freedom in Christ to receive that. We, it may be permissible. It's probably not beneficial. 
And, you know, however you feel about that and I feel about that and whatever we got going on between us and God and that, like, that's not really the subject today. Today is, like, how do we use or not use alcohol in the context of the body of Christ? And so I would say a, a good, fast rule for people that are raising people to walk with Jesus and people who are trying to help people who are um, prone to temptation, and I gotta keep, I gotta take this to heart myself, like, we don't do alcohol at church events. Nick's hosting a barbecue today. Nick, go home and get that cooler cleared out of all the beer, right? Isn't that timely? Nick's so bummed right now, right? Go hide it in the fridge and drink it later with your wife after everybody leaves, or if you got a few friends that stay after you, like, it's okay, you know, enjoy your Sunday afternoon. But at the same time, recognize who you're with. Know who you're with. When in doubt, leave it out. People have gotten so offended that I wouldn't let them sit around and drink beer at their D group. I'm like, look, I'll come have a beer with you, but not at your D group. And we got to know our audience, right? So just apply a little bit of common, a little common sense to that. Remember that even though we have great freedom in Christ, there's still absolutes in Christ. There is the law, and they, the Ten Commandments still mean a lot. And so if food sacrificed to idols means nothing to us, if we can drink our Starbucks and it means nothing to us, so be it. But if we start worshiping that mermaid, we got a problem. If we start ascribing to the philosophy of Target because it must be okay because they're mainstream, we've been desensitized. And... There are absolutes. I mean, the Apostle Paul said to, to one of the churches, he said, hey, here are the two rules I have for you. Actually, in general, you Gentiles, abstain from eating food sacrificed to idols, not because there's anything wrong with it necessarily, but because it violates the conscience of the Jewish and the weak believers in your fellowship. So just, you know, stay away from that. And sexual immorality. I mean, if you ask me, the, the three biggest sins in the church that are absolutes and that we need to keep an eye on and we really need to think about and our motivations in every conversation are greed, pride, and lust. And sex outside of a loving marriage between a man and woman committed in covenant before God. Any sex outside of that is not like, it's not like drinking coffee or wearing shoes. It's still sin. Abortion is still sin. Homosexuality is still sin. Adultery is still sin. Fornication is still sin. Sleeping with your boyfriend or girlfriend before being married is still, like, it's sin. If you're going to sin, you're going to sin, but it is sin, and know that it's sin. These are absolutes. This is not what we're talking about here. We have not just marginalized the truth of God, right? Keep that in mind. So one rule is on alcohol. Another rule, and this is not that important now, but could, one day it could be, um, and this is really for the women because it's not so much a problem the other way around. Like, we got to think about how we dress. Like, I don't know if you women know it or not, but we men, we're a mess. Right? You may think it's cute to show your shoulder, right? But it'll send somebody on a tire. Like, or your belly button, or wear tight clothes, right? And look, you're beautiful, God made you beautiful, and he created you in the garden to walk around beautiful and naked without any problems, but we got big problems now. We're not in the garden anymore. And maybe you want the attention, and maybe you don't want the attention, maybe you're sensitive to it, maybe you're insensitive to it, but the church, the sacred assembly of God's people need to be the one place where a man doesn't have to battle that have that on their conscience while they're trying to enter into the most sacred place with God. How do you like that rule? Now, I know that doesn't mean much to most of you, and Wendy, you probably think I'm calling you out specifically. I want you to know that you're not the only person who dresses inappropriately here, Mo, with all due respect. But that, that could be something we have to... You know, the, one of my biggest problems with this church right now is that we don't have women who dress inappropriately because we're not reaching lost women. So be ready to wrap your arms around them when they come. When, when, there was, when the great Jesus movement happened way back in the 70s or whenever it was, and the big church I went to in Atlanta, Mount Parent Church of God, they, I mean, the, the, the hippies started flocking 
like the girls would come in with those little mini skirts on and, and the elders and the elders' wives were standing at the door and they would wrap them in a robe as they came in, every single one of them, right? Because they had an instance where one fell on their face at the altar and <laughs> she was having a holy moment and the whole church was falling. It was a thing. So keep that in mind, ladies. And then a last word, it's not here, but it's in Romans 14, and this is to add perspective. Those of us who may be weaker or stricter in our faith, more disciplined, we need to be very, very careful not to cast judgment on those who have more freedom than us. Like, judge nothing before it's time. Maybe what seems like sin to you is just freedom to them. I don't know. Maybe they need to be more discreet. Maybe we need to talk to them about it, but like, who are we to judge anybody else's servant? As Romans 14 says, they will stand because God will make them stand. During this same period of time that I wouldn't walk into the Hard Rock Cafe, one time I went on vacation in Vail. My business partners had a, a condo there, and I got to go to Vail, and I'm hanging out in Vail. And uh, the guy I'm with, a strong Christian and I, were having a great ski trip, and we met another guy who was a believer, and, and we were all hanging out. We're having a great time in Vail. But I noticed that he spent a lot of money, and I noticed that he drank a lot, and I noticed that he was eating a lot, and I noticed that he didn't pray before his meals, and I never saw him get up and have a quiet time that entire trip. And I mean, and during my quiet time one morning, I'm like laying out like what a loser this guy. It's not even a Christian, Lord. And that version of me couldn't understand what was going on with that person. This version of me is like, oh, yeah, he probably is just really strong in his faith. He's secure in his faith, and he's enjoying his vacation. But whether he's right or wrong, it's not, it's not on me. It's between him and God. And maybe he has just more faith than I do, and so he doesn't feel like he has to get up at 6 in the morning on vacation and pray for three hours. So... Use your common sense. See, everything in the Bible has a purpose, including 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Can you imagine if you read this and you would have said, yeah, I'm not coming today because that's irrelevant to me. It's not irrelevant to you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you that um, when you speak, Lord, you speak over us with great authority and power. We thank you, Lord, that even though you're holy and you're awesome and you're strong and you're mighty, uh, at the exact same time, you're very, very good, kind, merciful, and faithful. When we draw near to you, you draw near to us. When we come boldly to your throne of grace in our time of need, you sprinkle our conscience. You cleanse our conscience. You do it. Not, we didn't do it by our own actions. You did it through, through the blood shed on the cross, and you give us the ability to commune and connect with you. I pray that this would be a church that makes it easy for someone to come into the presence of God, that we recognize the freedom we have in Christ and yet also protect the conscience of those who are weak among us. We thank you and praise you, Lord, because we feel like this is a word in season. This is a message coming to us at the right time because you're preparing us to be good spiritual leaders uh, to those in this community who would come here uh, seeking to know you, to love you, to be protected by you, and to be blessed by you. Thank you that you're growing us up in, in you um, so that we can lead others to follow in the same way that we follow you. We love you and praise you. Amen.